Today is Thursday, and we normally celebrate Thursdays by reflecting on the past week. One would think that we normally do this at the end of the week, but one would sadly be wrong. We do this on Thursdays because, well, Fridays are normally reserved for architecting the next couple of days. In most cases, and more specifically, the next two days. We consider things such as given the freedom to do whatever you like for the next 3,240 minutes, what would you do? Perhaps some gardening, or maybe even relaxing with a good book and some soft music. Or even spending some quality time with a good old friend, Jim. It's worth mentioning that this planning normally happens about 15 minutes before the dreaded last minute meeting on a Friday afternoon at 16.45, set up by that someone that just did not think. Like I said, Thursdays are awesome because we get an opportunity to reflect, but sometimes nothing happened during that last week and we had nothing to reflect on. So we look into our dis distant past and we call those when we's. As in, remember when we had that prot outage and I just could not get the ball service starting. We also call those throwback Thursdays. And well, because today is Thursday, let me start off with some throw throwback. Now look around the room, I see a lot of new faces. Most of you are still very young, and I can just imagine that you've not experienced the awesomeness of this conference. I also see some veterans present. Welcome, Max. <laughs> <laughs> the ones that have already been part of the BBD Collective for some time. For the one group, what I'm about to say will create context. And what I'm asking from you is to try and imagine the following. The other group will vaguely remember this. And for you, all I want to say is, Remember when we had Escape 2019? It was an in-person conference held in Rosebank in Johannesburg, only one location. This may shock you, but we all sat tightly packed and very close to each other. We laughed at the wonderful jokes made on stage with our mouths wide open without a care in the world about what our breasts smelled like. There were no masks in sight. We shoved and got shoved by our neighbors as they laughed in hysteria at the jokes made on stage, and we celebrated the incredible speakers that graced our stages and delivered amazing talks with loud, room-shaking applause. It was a good time. We started off the day with something that is these days perhaps less the talking point, but was then definitely the hot topic. At that stage, you could not walk past the futurists without hearing the words Industry 4.0 or the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Don't worry, I know exactly how you feel. I, for one, stood on that stage and said something contentious enough it would make most consultancies cringe. I said, I did not believe that we were experiencing the fourth industrial revolution. I argued that the hype created around Industry 4.0 was influencing our beliefs, and the continuous change around us was fueling our experience. All we were left with was a, a perspective of a life-changing event, or a revolution, if you may. I remember a recent conversation with young Lakin Kwasi about Fees Must Fall. He spoke of his experience as a young student leader during the first protests of 2015. He spoke of how he and fellow students truly believed that they were in the middle of a revolution that will not just change the landscape of education in this country, but potentially the world. In absolute disappointment, he concluded that not much had changed since those early days. Now, if we stop for a minute and consider what revolution is, it might help us to understand why the world felt that they were going through another industrial revolution, or why Lucky and the university students of 2015 and 16 felt that they were experiencing a revolution, and perhaps even my, why some people, people felt exactly the same way when violence broke out in Kaizetin and Khotim just a few months ago. It is important to note that revolution is not always violent. And for change to be considered a revolution, it must be radical. From an R4 perspective, one could argue that in certain industries, the impact of certain technologies such as robotics and analytics has been radical. From a Fees Must Fall and 2021 rights perspective, I think we can agree that they were radical. Secondly, it must fundamentally shift or change how things are done. After this point, that one thing cannot ever be the same again. Again, from an R4 perspective, in certain industries, things are fundamentally different. And from a feast was fall in 2021 rights perspective, 
even though they did not really achieve it, the aim was definitely to fundamentally change how things must be done. Change must also be sudden. There's nothing sudden about R4, except for maybe us suddenly realizing that things have actually changed over the years. I would agree that the fees must fall in 2021 rights were sudden, but there's something else that is potentially the most important thing about revolution, and that is things must actually change. After the fact, the thing must be different than it was before. From an R4 perspective, sure, things have changed. But from a fees must fall and 2021 rise perspective, they are most definitely still the same. None of these all check the boxes required to be considered a revolution. Now, from a technology perspective, and specifically IR4, we felt that we were, we were in the middle of a revolution because our senses were being overwhelmed by a plethora of developments in technology. And while it's seemingly easy to recognize changes in everyday life things, like the sport of golf, Digital technology's lack of dependence on substantial physical space and its shareability helped push developments faster than we've ever seen before. And while we were seeing massive improvements in development in technology, we are still missing that core ingredient of radical change that fundamentally changes the way we do things. And while we were smoking our pipes, theorizing in a tedious and pompous manner about the fundamental impact the fourth industrial revolution would have on our lives, the unthinkable happened. We were struck by an infectious disease that caused a pandemic at a scale that has not been seen in centuries. Life as we know it came to a complete halt. This world that we had convinced ourselves would not change for absolutely anything did just that. It stopped. Almost completely. And suddenly, we were all faced with an unprecedented time in our new democracy. In accordance with global best practice, we declared a state of disaster, which in turn limited our fundamental human rights in favor of preservation of life, and we went into hard lockdown. Our president said we'd be in lockdown for 21 days. Yeah, it is funny, because it turned out to be roughly the 21, same 21 days this guy got. The COVID caused lockdowns also had many effects on our society. The socio-economic impact of the lockdown has been catastrophic with rates of unemployment skyrocketing and youth unemployment in particular hitting crisis levels. Worst of all, we ran out of beer. <laughs> but while we mourn those that have left us and do our best to comfort those that have left behind, we note that the lockdown might have had some interesting side effects on how we look at the idea of work and the impact of technology on our society. About two years ago, just before we launched the Hive, our CEO, Mr. Peter Sill, walked into the Hive lab and felt, found the ATC team typing away in silence. We had tons of features to deliver just before the launch, which was just a couple of days away. From. And as you know, developers hate being interrupted. Peter still asked why we weren't working from home to avoid being interrupted, a question we could not answer. Then he made a comment that shifted our perception of work. He rhetorically asked, if you, the research and development team of only four people, cannot work remotely, how can we expect the rest of the business to do so? You see, Peter, much like other professionals in our business, have already been engaged in discussions around the future of work. And our survival was directly linked to our ability to work from anywhere in the world. In hindsight, nothing more than our imagination stopped us from working remotely. The tools we have at our disposal to that facilitate successful remote work already existed. Then. All we needed was that mind shift change, and it took the seismic event to shift to create that shift in all of us. For us, that seismic event was a soul, but for the rest of the world, it was the coronavirus. We have all lived through this pandemic. We've all witnessed and experienced its ups and its horrible downs. We are all experts of our lives, experiences, and perceptions of this pandemic. This is I even not what I want to talk to you about today. What I do wish to discuss, discuss is slightly more future-facing. We note that the lockdown has changed a lot of things, 
from how we bank, shop, work, seek and receive medical attention, socialize, celebrate, and even mourn. The developments in computer-related technology helped facilitate pandemic responses, from coordinating emergency response um, efforts to helping us to get to a vaccine uh, quicker by analyzing data faster. It helped keep people informed, connected to each other, speed up charge, and even deliver medicine and medical services more efficiently. Technology has helped us to survive, but helped others to thrive in very tumultuous times. With COVID, we have experienced a seismic event that has fundamentally changed how we do things, potentially forever. And combined with the massive exponential industrial developments over the past decade or so, it is only now that we can start talking revolution. Whether we believe we have is non-consequential in this context, because now that we've gone through this bad we have to ask a key question. A question that's on everyone's mind in one way or another. A question that futurists and tech evangelists are capitalizing on by punting their technologies and processes forward as the answer to the simple but important question. And the question is, now what? What happens to how we work, play, and relate to each other on the other side of this pandemic? Will we ever shake hands again? Will we wear masks when we have a cold from now on? Will we ever party till 5 a.m. again? Will we ever work from an office on a full-time basis again? And the answer is 42. <laughs> As technology professionals, we all have a responsibility to ask this very same question, but in a slightly more different context, a more important, uh, important context, if you will. We have to ask, how does COVID and its impact on society affect our field, and what do we have to do differently in the short, medium, and long term to appropriately respond to it? The thing is, technology has played such a crucial role in keeping the world going. So where do we even begin? A look at client and consumer tech trends provide a decent starting point. And I think there's one good term that can summarize the changes that we are experiencing, and that is digital transformation. Yes, technology evangelists have been punting this term for a long time, and it does explain what we are witnessing. But we need a slightly more granular view to understand things a little better. Forbes put together a council of technology experts from across the world and they identified 14 major business and consumer tech trends that they believe are here to stay. I've combined the related ones, but we'll only be talking about seven that affect our industry in particular. And the first one is digital transactions. We know that most of our clients, and potentially many industries across the world, are focusing on adopting digital payments. Pat Kinzel, who is the founder and CEO of Notarize, argued that a tech trend that will soon shake things up for consumers will be the rise of digital transactions as a necessity, not just a convenience. And while we in developing nations are not yet fully there due to our large informal economic sector that largely deal in cash, the rise of products and services provided in South Africa by players such as Yoko and the Coca card machines are playing a fundamental role in enabling these informal traders to use digital transactions. And similar, um, but similar tools are growing in popularity across the globe. The growth of small scale focused online stores is another indication that we are moving to this becoming uh, the norm. Do yourself a favor and check out the business on the Mount talk where he talks about some of these uh, trends and aims to show you how quickly you can get an online store going. Over the last two years, we've all seen this sign. Most retail outlets, in an attempt to, spread, uh, to curb the spread of COVID, have adopted some type of cashless payment mechanism. Now, it is worth noting that I don't do shops. Everything I do is online and results in some delivery. Unfortunately, sometimes some eventual delivery. And the same goes for my beer. So you cannot, cannot blame me for being excited when my beer delivery guy stopped over for my weekly delivery with the same sign on his delivery van door. So as Pat Kinzel puts it, 2020 proved that digital transactions can be safe and secure, and there's no going back to fully in-person or paper-based transactions. The second one is fintech. 
Vikram Srivats, who's the vice president of go-to-market and GM of America's at WaveMaker, who's a company that provides an a, a open, open low-code platform for fintech application developers, suggested that consumers are using new ways to do their banking, pay bills, and invest, all without setting a foot in a bank. I think this is something we can all relate to. In a local context, 2020 saw companies like Old Mutual release funeral insurance policy applications and claim processes via services like WhatsApp in order to eliminate um, branch traffic. Well, this is largely to minimize social interaction. The convenience it has brought its clients positions services in key engagement channels, uh, channels like this well when we consider the future of fintech in South Africa. <coughs> Excuse me. Number three is telehealth. The health sector, as we know, it had to change the way it operates. A field that traditionally depended on physical contact was forced to evolve. Now, remote consultations, remote testing, and monitoring are commonplace. The impact on cost reduction and convenience that comes with it means that telehealth is likely here to stay. And staying slightly on the same topic, number four is health wearables. That combined with telehealth makes for an interesting topic. These devices help produce critical data that in turn help professionals understand their patients better. The lockdown also forced people to individualize their physical training, driving up investment in health and uh, uh, sorry, health and exercise related uh, wearables. For most people, this helped gamify an otherwise tedious, painful and boring experience, helping those like the BBD Strava group to get some sort of reward out of running unprovoked. Number five, improved connectivity. We've all borne witness to what some may call the 5G wall. This has led to some people in the audience being severely frustrated by the brand new wireless phone that needs to operate without Google mobile services. When you suddenly had to go fully remote last year, we had a challenge of ensuring that everyone was connected from their homes. For some, this was already in place, but for others, we had to come up with a plan. Fortunately for a lot of us, Run had just launched its services in 2019, connecting the previously unconnected at reasonable cost. This is also the beginning of the race to connect the previously excluded at more affordable prices. The race is however heating up. While Rain continues to expand its 5G infrastructure across Suwetu, Tembisa, and other townships, we see companies like Vumatel laying fiber optic cables throughout Suwetu and surrounding areas. What is amazing to see is that both these providers are providing low-cost, uncapped, prepaid options at under 500 rand a month. The state, which is always a key role player in societal development, also have seemed to have realized to you the importance of access to connectivity and have reinstated its city-sponsored limited Wi-Fi service in some metros. Now, with Suwetu alone having the population three times that of Botswana, all this development will lead to millions more people uh, being able to access digital products and services, which in turn will improve access to basic services and business opportunities. Number six is home automation. With everyone spending more time at home, people appear to be investing more in making their homes comfortable. From the request you've received to subsidize chairs, desks, backup power, all the way to people realizing that they've not been investing in decent coffee. We've seen a considerable shift in how people perceive comfort in their homes. This is likely to lead to an increase in home automation as well. According to the International Data Corporation, worldwide shipments of home, uh, smart home devices surpassed 801 million units in 2020, an increase of 4.5% uh, over 2019. And the annual increase is forecasted to hit double digits in under two years. Now, all the previously listed developments play a pivotal role in supporting the last one, which is the gig economy. With the current youth unemployment crisis we are witnessing in the country, key players will seek to create employment engagements, and a massive portion of these will not be permanent employment opportunities. The developments we are seeing will be the bedrock of the gig economy, connecting opportunities to those that are ready to grab them. So the question is, what does this all mean to us? 
Now that we know these consumer trends, what do, what do we need to understand and how do they affect our industry in particular? So the question really is, what do all of these key technology trends have in common? And the answer is data. All these technology trends that we've spoken about requires access to more and more data. And unfortunately, the data it requires is personal and sensitive in nature. Manual and physical processes have only two players, the consumer, or sorry, the customer and the service provider. In this space, sensitive data would only be passed between these two players. And as we develop solutions, we facilitate the transfer of sensitive data between these stakeholders. But why is this so crucial to us? Because data is now one of the most valuable commodities in the world. Think about that for a second. The most valuable companies in the world are tech companies that collect huge amounts of data from the users. At first, when these companies came onto the scene, users were excited about their services being free of charge, but they are now wiser. Users all over the world are well aware that by giving up their data, they actually pay for these free services companies such as Facebook and Google offer. This newfound understanding of the value of data is both a good thing and a bad thing. It's good because users know that they, they have agency and that they've got value to give back to these um, tech giants. It also encourages tech companies to improve the quality of the services that they provide in order to compete and retain the active users. The downside to this general understanding of the value of data is that even people with malicious intent understand this. Criminals will exist for as long as there's something to steal and people to exploit. According to Checkpoint's mid-year security report, the frequency of ransomware attacks has increased dramatically in the past year, with 93% more attacks carried out in the first half of 2021 than for the same period last year. Along with ransomware attacks, organizations have also experienced a 29% increase in the number of cyber attacks globally, with the highest growth seen in the Europe, Middle East, Africa region. These attacks have dark consequences on the individual and organization being attacked, but also for society at large. Here's an example. Just a few months ago, a ransomware attack on the U.S. Colonial Pipeline caused a six-day shutdown of company operations. This, in turn, forced the public into panic buying, resulting in fuel shortages and ultimately the disruption of essential services in different parts of the U.S. Here's another one. A ransomware attack on Kaseya, which is an IT service provider, was set to impact 1,500 downstream businesses and 60 Kaseya customers. The attack was on this remote device management software, which was used to spread the ransomware to downstream businesses and clients. Cyber attacks on our clients happen every day. Historically, these have largely been a concern of security experts employed by our clients. As application developers, we have never had to worry about that. And while our clients can spend billions of rands into protecting their databases and infrastructure from data leaks and cyber attacks, it is important to note that we as humans are still the most common security risk. From our clients to our staff to their customers, they all pose a risk to the privacy and security of the business, meaning that to a degree, we are responsible for ensuring the safety and security of their sensitive data. It's worth checking out Robert Passon on demand talk where he highlights some of the ways that people leak sensitive information on social media attacks. Slow to the party, but thankfully governments across the world are starting to wake up. About a hundred years ago, a new commodity spawned a lucrative, fast-growing industry, prompting antitrust regulators to step in and restrain those who controlled its flow. Then, the resource in question was oil. Governments across the world realized that the, the um, economies and the stabilities of the countries were now starting to rest on this commodity. And they realized that the companies that had the monopoly on this resource had to be reined in and regulated to ensure that they don't abuse their power. Data is fast becoming this new oil. It is the most valuable commodity in the world, and governments realize this. So much so that the U.S. government is considering instituting antitrust laws similar to those faced by oil companies almost a century ago. 
Some of these proposed changes will even seek to force tech giants to sell off their related stakes in, in companies. Now, at this point, I want to pause for a moment and share something else about myself. I don't know why, but I always have this little appreciation for the underdog. This is the one we always believe would have little chance of success. Maybe I'll feel sorry for them because they lack the support those who always win get. Or because I fundamentally dislike being a lemming. The thing about the underdog is they always look like they stand a chance to win, and sometimes they do. But probably the biggest reason I appreciate them is that they constantly make these stupid mistakes. But sometimes there's something so ballsy it amazes everyone. So I support teams like the Sharks. It's always pleasant to see what jokes the other teams can come up with after a massive win over the Sharks. Also, you won't believe me, but my favorite Formula One team was the Arrows Grand Prix International team. Not because Orange sponsored them or because the car was orange, but <coughs> excuse me, because when you look up underdog in the dictionary, you'll find the word and their logo right next to it. When we talk about consistency, we think arrows. They were awesomely consistent at often changing the car engines. The race between 1978 and 2002, and in the final years, tried everything from Yamaha, Renault, Peugeot, and then ended back at the Cosworth engine, which was actually a Ford engine, but without all the oil leaks. The last one, and my favorite underdog, is this guy. You have to love him. This guy's done it all, and the most impressive thing he's done is building an empire worth $1.2 trillion. Does anyone have an idea of how much it is? Let me rather show you. When you take this amount in $100 bills, and you're able to find a scale large enough to put it on, it will weigh about 12,100 tons. This is roughly the weight of five fully grown mature male African elephants. I'm not kidding. I'm also not done. This is the Burj Khalifa, topping out at an impressive 828 meters. Now, if you had to take those $100 bills and you had to stack them one on top of the other, it would equal not 1,596 meters, but an impressive 1,596 of these puppies stacked on top of each other. I'm going to stop there. Because I tried to convert this amount to South African rands and then rupees. <laughs> the process it required to complete this task was so memory intensive, my computer blue screened. <laughs> so let's rather get back to this guy. Mr. Zuckerberg has been in the news so much that he was even offered his own show. It did not happen because, well, I guess he just did not need the money. But things may very soon change for him. In August, the US Federal Trade Commission refiled his complaint against Facebook, arguing that the company should be broken up and forced to sell Instagram and WhatsApp. The biggest worry was actually uh, over the size and power of the Facebook empire and how Facebook has brought up competitors along the way. Things were mostly calm then, until a whistleblower came onto the scene and all hell broke loose. Slayer versus the man. A couple of punches out of the red corner resulted in the Facebook share price slightly trembling as users took to social media, accusing the, of the giant of unethical behavior. Then, on October 4, 2021, at quarter past five in the afternoon, two things happened. The first one, my personal son comes hysterically storming into my awesome new work from home office, yelping in that screechy, high pitched voice only a 13 year can produce. The Wi Fi is down, the Wi Fi is down. In my kindest and most gentle voice, I asked him how he knew, and in between all the tears rolling down his face, he replied, My insta is not updating, and I cannot WhatsApp my friends. And while I'm desperately attempting to deal with this crisis, the second one happens. My phone rings, and on the other side is my dear old Nana, who is now chilling at a good old age just north of 90. 
I could not properly answer the phone because in, uh, in a panicky voice filled with uncontrolled fear and anxiety, all I could make out was, you have to come now, my Facebook is not working. What a day. Facebook was up the next day, and they officially reported that the culprit was changes to the underlying internet infrastructure that coordinate the traffic between their data centers. Mm. Rumor has it that somebody flipped that switch while saying, take that, you ungrateful bastards. <laughs> to continue and bring things closer to home and closer to the consumer space, governments are putting in regulations in place to govern how we handle user state and will seek to hold us liable should we be found to have compromised their digital safety. By now, you should have all been bombarded by emails from different companies telling you all about the Protection of Personal Information Act. We're not alone. Poppy is very similar to the General Data Protection Regulation, which is an EU law on data protection and privacy in the European Union and European Economic Area. Again, what does this all mean to us? Despite our industry having started largely as a hobbyist field, and our desperate attempts to keep that spirit alive because, well, apparently it fosters innovation. We need to realize that we are, in fact, a professional engineering practice field. It means the question that we ask can no longer just be, does it work? We now need to ask, does it work and is it safe? Picture this. A city council stands in front of a giant ribbon. The mayor with giant scissors in his hand is ready to cut that ribbon. And as the final step to the process, the chief engineer sounds off the, the bridge in full view of the media. And as they all marvel at the glorious erection he has created, the engineer reads out loud, we hereby confirm that the bridge has been built and it works. After the ribbon cutting ceremony, the engineer and the mayor gets into a car and drives across the bridge and then back again, signifying the ceremonious opening of the bridge. And everyone cheer and they all go home. On Monday morning, more people start using the bridge, including taxis and trucks. The bridge buckles and collapses, causing multiple serious injuries. The question here is, who in the development cycle of the bridge is at fault? This is a loaded question with a myriad of possible correct answers. We can't answer this question definitively because we are missing a lot of context. Who is at fault? This is also not necessarily the best question to ask. At BBD, we don't really deal in finger pointing. We understand that every mistake is an opportunity for learning and growth. We preempt catastrophic outcomes and putting preventative measures to mitigate against them. So we never really have to ask these questions. So I'll rephrase the question slightly and ask, Whose responsibility was it to ensure that the bridge is strong enough to deal with the load? This is a more proactive question that helps us to preempt potential failure rather than the reactive one that try to put blame on one person alone. Perhaps the traffic officials that was directing traffic that morning had to stop heavy vehicles from going on it. How were the officers supposed to, to know that they had to do this? Maybe the drivers are at fault. Maybe they should have realized that the bridge was full and not overloading it by driving in the emergency lane, ultimately creating three lanes in each direction, putting 50% more load on that bridge. The fact is, users don't care. They see a piece of road, even untarred, and they drive on it. Maybe it was procurement's fault for buying subpar materials. Maybe it's the contractor's fault for not understanding the quality of materials and putting in enough supportive material to carry the load. Maybe it's the engineer's fault for not designing something stronger. Maybe it's the PM's fault for rushing the team and getting them to cut corners in order to save time and money. Is it perhaps the architect and analyst's fault for not providing research-backed clear requirements about the load that would be expected on a busy day in a city like Johannesburg? Is it the city's fault for not having processes or checks and balances in place to ensure that the quality of work that they paid for is of top notch. Which of these roles are responsible for ensuring the, that the bridge did not collapse on the increased load? Think about that for a second. 
Now try to superimpose that problem onto the SDLC. Whose responsibility is it to ensure that we deliver working and reliable software? And I use the word reliable deliberately and on purpose because anyone that has ever dealt with a South African government department will know the age-old proverb, the system is down. Reliable systems are ones that ensure that we never have to face things like this. It is such an important field that Jason and Ricky will be giving a joint talk later on the emerging field of site reliable engineering and how it can help us to build more resilient and reliable systems. You should definitely check that one out. I can only ever speak from the perspective of my background and my life experiences, so I'll look at it from that angle. For those of you that come from a formal engineering background like I do, you remember that we were all given a superiority, a superiority complex and were taught that engineers are superheroes and as such are responsible for the success and failure of any project they work on. Bad spec, you should have done your due diligence, straight to jail. Your boss asked you to cut corners in order to save money, you should have said no because safety always comes first, straight to jail. Dumb user doing weird and dumb things, you should have designed it better, straight to jail. But this is not entirely reflective of the, re the realities of working on real-life enterprise projects. Whether we're building a bridge, a car, a house, a computer, or even a piece of enterprise software, you seldomly work alone. It takes that combined intelligence and collaboration of different people of varying strengths, skill sets, and experience to bring a project to life. Every person has a role to play in the, the success and failure of any project. On the Collab Bridge, everyone involved had a role to play in ensuring the safety of everyone who used that bridge. The question asked from the bridge engineer is never just does it work. The question is, does it work and is it safe to use? A question we are also asked about the software that we create. The software we build now has a fundamental impact on, on society. Um, it has a direct impact on people's lives and livelihoods. Think about digitized medical records, banking, taxes, and even renewing your driver's license. The systems we build are fundamentally taking charge of people's lives, whether they like it or not. This makes everyone in the software development life cycle responsible for maintaining the privacy and digital security of everyone. This means we too have to ask, does it work and is it safe to use by everyone? How do we ensure this? By incorporating privacy and safety into everything we do and everything that we touch. Just as we think about security by design when it comes to infrastructure, we need to think privacy by design when it comes to data, data and the systems that we build. This means we all need to adhere to the core principles of data protection and incorporate them into everything we do. And these principles are number one, lawfulness, fairness, and transparency. Data shall be processed lawfully, fairly, and in a transpa uh, transparent manner in relation to the individual. Number two, purpose limitation. Data shall be collected for a specified, explicit, and legitimate purpose and not further processed in a manner that is incompatible with those um, purposes. Number three, data minimization. Adequate, relevant, and limited to what is necessary. Number four, accuracy. Accurate and, when necessary, kept up to date. Number five. Storage limitation. Kept in a form which permits identification of the data subject for no longer than is necessary and for the purposes which the personal data are processed. Number six, integrity and confidentiality. Meaning that everything must be processed in a manner that ensures appropriate security of personal data. This includes protection against unauthorized and unlawful processing, accidental loss and destruction of data. It is important to remember that these rules are fairly serious. As it turns out, as information officer of the group, should any one of you forget about any of these rules? 
not you. I go straight to jail. But the question still remains. How do each one of these pillars affect the different roles within the SDLC? Well, for business, test, and system analysts, as well as everyone, anyone involved in usability research and requirements gathering, it is not just about how the system we are built will function. It's also about identifying privacy pitfalls and engaging our clients on those. It means asking your clients questions like, but why do you need that piece of information from your client? This forces clients to think about privacy and limits the blast radio should we suffer a data leak or a breach in one of our privacy guards. Later today, Liesl Bep McKay will give a talk on the art of facilitation and will give, it, uh, give you techniques on how to engage your clients more efficiently. For the architects, designers, and developers in the audience. This means having and automating data storage policies that, in addition to securing your users' data, ensures that you only store what is absolutely necessary. It also means that when you design that API endpoint, you need to follow best practices that, and only request the data that you absolutely need. It also means considering privacy as a factor when deciding what front-end framework to use on your new project. Mel will give a talk later on a, uh, entitled A Better View, where she explains how to go about picking the best framework for your project for those leading the way. This means factoring in time to build these checks and balances into our cost and time estimations. It means engaging our clients on the importance of this work and helping them to realize that it is for the benefit of their business and their customers. Jakub Fenter, who heads up BBD's Managed Cloud Services Division, will later give a talk on cloud migrations, where he touches on critically engaging your clients about the importance of uh, technology in their business or for their businesses and clients. Tabang also has an on-demand talk focused on leadership and remote work amidst the global pandemic. I believe that what we do in this field is nothing short of miraculous. We create incredible things out of almost nothing. Things that facilitate and touch every aspect of our society and everyday lives. We are the Harrodinis of modern software. And just as magicians are responsible for the safety of their crowds, assistants, and themselves, we too need to make certain that we take every reasonable measure to protect the people we build software for. So while policies like Poppy and GDPR come with a lot of legal jargon, and while some view it as government's overreach into this fun and emerging um, industry, reality is that we operate in a field that touches every aspect of people's life. We therefore need to be cognizant of, of our impact um, on the last and do our best to make sure that it is always positive. We may not like it, but this fun and playful industry is now a professional engineering practice. I'm not saying that we should regulate how we write code or require everyone to have a master's degree, not at all. What I'm saying is that we should hold ourselves to the highest professional standards because we are professionals. We should be cognizant of the impact our work has on society and understand that every line of code that we write is an active decision. When we cut corners, we are actively deciding to put our projects, people, clients, and users at risk. As professionals, we need to understand that the high security and privacy standards require us to put in effort into learning, unlearning, and relearning. In BBD, we have experts in every technological field. So talk to, about, uh, talk to us about your learning needs, and we'll put you in contact with those that can help you on your way. The threat is out there, and it keeps on growing and evolving every day. And we need to grow and evolve even faster than it can. And the only way we can do this is by introspection, collaboration, and constant learning. Finally, what I'm asking from you is the following. When you get back to work, ask yourself if you're doing everything possible in your role to ensure that our clients and their customers have every possible means of protection when they interact with us. And because today is Thursday, and we normally celebrate Thursdays by reflecting on the past week, Take a moment and sit down to reflect on what you need to learn and change to bring yourself and those around you to stand in front of that symbolic ribbon and say, it works and it is safe to use. And with that, 
I welcome each and every one of you to the Great Escape of 2021. Thank you, and please enjoy the rest of this conference.